Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Allure of the Poor, sponsored by Dracina Wines. Today, we are remotely traveling to Texas with Julie Colkin of Petter Nallis Cellars. Did I say it correctly? You did. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> um, so we virtually or telephony kind of talked uh, for an article that I was writing about Texan wine. And I wanted to dive even deeper than what that article allowed me to dive into. And I, you sent me three amazing wines and I wanted to share these wines with my listeners. So we're going to dive a little deeper into Texas and what it means to be Texan wine and a Texas person. Um, and so, and got, get into these wines. So welcome, Julie. Thank you. Glad yeah. to be here. Awesome. So first question I always ask is, you know, the origin story. So I mean, I'm kind of curious. You you go from I read you have a PhD in philosophy. Yes. So I, I've come to understand nobody gets into the wine industry directly. You know, it's very few people who get into the wine industry directly. So how did you go from philosophy to wine? Yeah, no, I think people get into the wine industry directly through their family. You know, the the wine industry is family business dominant, and even some of the huge you know, conglomerates have a family background like Gallo or someone like that. So uh, in our case, uh, the reality is it's really because of our parents. Uh, my parents um, took early retirement uh, through IBM and they had both grown up in farms and they just, they were up in Dallas at the time, which is where my mother's family is from. And that's where we're a sixth generation Texas family is that her family has been up there since basically the mid 19th century. So um, anyway, so they took an early retirement project and ended up, you know, they, it's funny at some point, I mean, years after this fact, someone asked, well, why did you choose wine grapes? And they said, well, you know, in the mid nineties, if you looked at Texas, what the agricultural new projects were, one was emus, right? And most people <laughs> who are outside the state don't even remember this, but people who do are like, Oh yeah, that pyramid scheme with emus, right? You buy two emus and, you know, uh, and then wine grapes. It was really in the mid nineties that people again got interested in the potential of growing wine grapes in Texas. Uh, and we have very different conditions from California, but we do have, you know, if you look at Iberian, meaning Spanish and Portuguese conditions, you look at Southern Rhone, Southern France, Italy and the southern parts, you realize that we have actually very good conditions for growing wine grapes. And so that's what my parents chose to do. Uh, they had a long-term family friends who were in the Washington wine industry, and they came down and consulted my parents and helping them plant. And then David and I, who's my brother and I, you know, were we were both basically finishing up college in college, and we came down and helped, um, you know, plant the vineyard, harvest when it came, became time. Uh, but for us, it was more nearly our parents' project until basically a decade later that my brother and I, we had reached a sort of transition in terms of our careers and said, you know, maybe it's time to start a winery based on Colkin Vineyards, which is the name of our vineyard. Uh, and then we formed Pedernales Cellars. Pedernales is the major river through this part of the hill country. And so that's why we chose that name. The reason there's confusion as to the pronunciation is that this is LBJ country. Uh, this is where the Texas White House was in the 1960s, which actually brought an enormous amount of attention to the area. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson decided to call it the Perd Analysis. Uh, <laughs> and so most people now pronounce it the Perd Analysis as opposed to the Pat Analysis. Uh, anyway, Pedernales means Flintstone in Spanish. Uh, and so uh, it actually informs our logo and everything. So, uh, but anyway, but that's the basis for the name. So, well, who was, who was the president? Was it Clinton? I think it was, but I, I don't, I don't want to get in trouble for that. But there was a president who, who said, um, or Bush, uh, and called it Arkansas. Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> more likely to be Bush. Bush. <laughs> he had a lot of malapropisms. He, uh, he was one of those presidents who, you know, 
misspoke <laughs> Spontaneous frequently, <laughs> frequently. <laughs> yes yes I said I first said Clinton and I was like no 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 I'm pretty confident it was Bush but I remember that Arkansas what the <laughs> where are you talking about <laughs> I think that's worse than pronouncing the river wrong I think <laughs> yeah well you know anyway but uh, <laughs> it has stuck and and I, I can say the the legacy of LBJ in this area you feel very heavily because oh, okay. it, it wasn't for him I mean, a lot of people describe the fact that they, you know, they were journalists covering LBJ and they had to come out to central Texas and then they would go, their only place to stay was Fredericksburg, which is the town that's in the center of the hill country. And it's an old German settlement, uh, settled again about mid 19th century. And it's a really, really charming town. And it was not on the map, except to people within Texas and particularly central Texas. And suddenly it gained national recognition, like, oh, this is not the Texas you were expecting. You were expecting what you see, you know, in West Texas, that great flat you right. know, plain. And it, this is the hill country. It is hilly, it is green, it is not I'm not gonna say lush. That would be too far. <laughs> But that might be is. pushing it just a bit. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's traditional fruit crop is peaches. Okay. Um, so, but you can also grow strawberries, uh, blueberries and other, you know, so it is a fruit. And that's very common that, you know, places that become good wine regions are actually fruit crop regions. Yes. Tree fruit and bush fruit. Yes, so. absolutely. Absolutely. But I think it's um, an interesting concept that people just in general for anything have one opinion of what an entire place is like and it's kind mm -hmm. of similar to how they think of people too but you know a single place is this big thing so i grew up in jersey and everybody's like oh my god jersey is horrible jersey is horrible it's so ugly it's this it's that I'm like well that's because you're flying into newark Yes. And <laughs> Newark. <laughs> that's all you see. And yeah, Newark, you know, is, you know, they're, they're regentrifying it and all that stuff, but you can't associate all of New Jersey with Newark. There's a reason why we're the garden state, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's a beautiful state in a lot of areas. And then there's Newark, you know? <laughs> so, um, and that was one of the things that I, I uh, gained the the understanding of when I was researching for the article is your your AVAs are broad and expansive and but the differences from almost three miles in one direction to three miles in another direction are very different. And so now your main, I guess, AVA is the Texas Hill Country. Yes. Okay. So can, you said it was hilly and things like that, but can you when when let's go back a bit when you family first planted in the 1990s were you was your family kind of one of the original planters in there or was it already starting to build as the wine as the wine area it's it, it was a very slow recognition i mean of texas in general um but i mean including the hill country uh basically i i always tell this story because i've seen it in several like when you talk about regional wine in the United States, you're basically talking about wine that's not on the West Coast, right? You know, West Coast is not considered regional wine, but it's just an established wine corridor, right? All the way up to Washington. But the rest of the country really can be considered regional wine. And I find over and over and over again, you go to one of these, you know, New York, Virginia, Michigan, Colorado, and there's some guy who one day walks out of his front door and says, this is wine country, right? And they just declare it, right? And they just go from that premise. And in the hill country, that guy was Bob Oberhelman. Mm -hmm. Bob Oberhelman in 1980, 80, 82, he decided, no, this is a great place to grow grapes. And he's just up the road from where our vineyard is. And he uh, he planted a vineyard. He was up to 30 acres at the, the max of his his production. And he actually formed the first AVA that's entirely in Texas, which is Bell Mountain uh, AVA, mm -hmm. which is where our vineyard is within. It's a very small AVA and it preceded the Hill Country, which is interesting. And I've got to admit how, that confused me in the article. Yes. I'm like, but how can this be the first AVA? And then, you know, like 
Paso Robles. We have Paso Robles AVA. Then the sub AVAs or nestled AVAs came right. up. That's not happening in Texas, <laughs> but no. Texas and doesn't really, do anything we, like anybody else, right? <laughs> yeah, no. Well, and we just didn't, that process, everyone agrees that that process needs to start because if you, I mean, what happened then is in 1992, Fall Creek uh, formed the Texas Hill Country ABA, and they did what you do in Texas. You take the largest possible extent and you say, that's an ABA, and it's 9 million acres, right? It's absurdly big. From any ABA perspective, you know you're taking in multiple soil types, multiple climates, all kinds of things. And so that's really sort of been an open project for people to say, okay, no, this is a sub ABA, ABA here and sub ABA there. And the industry is just slowly maturing to that point where you're going to start to see that. Same thing is true of the other major, major ABA in Texas, which is the High Plains, mm -hmm. which is the source of, depending on who you talk to, 75 to 80% of the grapes in Texas, okay. uh, largely because they are professional farmers, right? And they're looking for crops that they can rely on. And of course, one of their biggest challenges is water. And grapes use less water than any of their other traditional crops, which were, have been cotton and peanuts for the most part. So, uh, but yes, there's an enormous project in Texas still to happen to keep dialing down these ABAs. In our case, because we, you know, my parents did an enormous amount of research to choose where they planted their vineyard. And in fact, I was living in the Bay Area at the time. And my father went to UC Davis, was looking at soils and all kinds of things. And they, I would say they chose extremely well. They actually identified a part of the Hill Country, what is now the Texas Hill Country ABA, which is, it has, it has degraded sandstone and limestone. It has excellent aspect. It has elevation. It has all the things you're looking for. And so the fact that it was identified early as a wine, grow, wine grape growing region is not surprising, but there's many other sub AVAs. I think I described to you. It's like, if you look at a soil map and a geological mm -hmm. map of the hill country, it's like a peacock's tail. I mean, there's just a little of everything uh, because what really constitutes the hill country is the Llano uplift, which is where very old stone pushed up and that made it hilly, but it also meant you had all these different, you have granite, you have limestone, you have sandstone. And then of course your time, and that pushed up millions of years ago and it's eroded since, right? And so it forms all kinds of aspects and, you know, if you will, subregions. And of course, one of the most important, an important part of the hill country is aspect because we do have late spring freezes and so mm -hmm. you never want to be in one of those freeze pockets right where all the cool air collects you can just get above it we in our site we have a, a breeze that is almost continuous that obviously makes a huge difference because when you have that kinetic energy so all of these things make a difference in the hill country and i have no doubt that over time it will get mapped much more specifically it's just that process we're just such a young wine region or wine state. So, and it's not easy to, you know, the government's not like, hey, do this and we're going to approve it instantaneously. Right. No, it's no, usually like, really usually like a three to five year, if you're lucky, you know, um, process. <laughs> but do you see, like, if you start dialing down, do you see that maybe Texas Hill AVA kind of? disappears or becomes its own little sub, you know, smaller section. And now you're going to have, you know, more specific AVAs or do you think I it, of, I think the, probably the closest model, at least when I, when I think about it, it's, it's more like, um, the Rhone, right? The Rhone is a huge area, right? That just basically says, and I, I'm really thinking the Southern Rhone, not Northern Rhone, but the okay. Southern Rhone where you have the Cote de Rhone, you know, like huge area uh, that is defined by the Mistral and by that river valley, right? But then within it, I mean, I was just, the reason I'm thinking is I was just there. And <gasps> Lucky I you. Went, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went to the Vacada, right? Which is one of the subregions that's formed over time. And of course, France has this very regimented system for, you know, marching from being part of the huge AVA or that's not AVA, but the Appalachian mm -hmm. to being more and more specific. But, you know, in this case, the Vacardot is very obvious. 
you literally go up onto this plateau that is above everything else mm -hmm. around it. And it's fairly flat. It's got the the galley, this huge stones and everything. And you're like, oh, clearly this is a distinct place. And I think something like that's going to happen in the hill country. Because as I said, it is, there are places where granite is more dominant. There's places where sandstone is more dominant. There's places where limestone is more dominant. And it, those will start to coalesce. The example I always give is that one of our, our partners within a, a grouping of uh, organization we're part of which is texas fine wine is spicewood vineyards and early on my parents planted sauvignon blanc uh, as one of the great varieties that they tested and tried to grow and it was a disaster i mean it was nothing that i mean the plants look miserable so but you go over to where spicewood is and it's a good distance but the fact is what really distinguishes it is they have much more limestone than we do um, and suddenly they can grow excellent Sauvignon Blanc, which is not as an obvious great variety for Texas. Uh, and so, yes, discovering and identifying, well, where is the border of those like sub regions will be very helpful to consumers going forward. We're just, we're on the path to that. We just, you know, you know everyone want, wants to always think of the AVAs as, you know, these scientific and you know like designations but there's always a marketing force you do define them as they're useful to yourself so absolutely and you use them to your benefit or not to your benefit you know there are there are definite avas out there not texas not you know there, but generally just across the board there's avas that wineries choose not to use the ava they choose the larger broader right because it's yeah, it's because that's more or, or, yeah right. Mm -hmm. It's more recognizable to say the general thing versus the more specific. Mm -hmm. So we're okay. I can't wait to drink because I see you sipping, and I'm like, no, I got to try this. I've got to try this. So one of the things uh, when you sent me the samples, I got so excited was that you sent um, your estate vineyard, uh, Colkin Vineyards, Thuriga Nacional. So. Mm -hmm. First of all, we've got to talk about this because nobody else that I saw makes it. So that was one of the reasons, but I just like the grape and as, as its own entity, as its own thing. So tell us where is this, where the vineyard site, the Colkin Vineyard is in the Texas Hills AVA and what exact soils is that? Cause I'm assuming maybe that plot is a little different that you're growing this there. Well, I drink. Well, this is, I mean, basically, Colkin Vineyards is uh, 11.5 miles north of Fredericksburg, which, as I said, is sort of a central town. It's this German historical town. Um, but when you start in Fredericksburg and you go to where Colkin Vineyards are, you go up about 600 to 650 feet uh, you know, higher in sea level. So you're climbing the entire time. Uh, and then, as I said, it is a vineyard of degraded sandstone and limestone. Uh, Tariga Nacional as a grape, you know, as I said, when my parents originally planted, they planted, as I say, Sauvignon Blanc, they planted Chardonnay, they planted Merlot, they, they planted what they could sell because they had no intention of making wine. So they needed to be able to sell these grapes. And in the 1990s, the consensus was, that's it, right? I mean, other than Pinot Noir, which we were not going to grow in Texas. <laughs> so, you know, you had to grow those grapes. And so they grew them. Uh, the whites immediately recognized were a mistake. The Cab and Merlot you can grow. The reality is that Bordeaux varieties like a very long growing season. And we have a short growing season in Texas, mm. right? Uh, we ripen very quickly. We have an enormous number of sun hours. It's an extremely sunny place. Uh, and so when we formed Pedernales Cellars a decade later, we took a big bet on Tempranillo. So that's, I mean, that's our mainstay red. Um, but then we were like, okay, well, you know, what else should we plant? And so we planted Rhone varieties, Grenache and Morved, particularly. And then partially because we wanted to do port, but partially because they're also warm weather varieties, we planted Triga Nacional. Tenta Amarillo and Tenta Cow, which are Portuguese varieties. And obviously mm -hmm. Tempranillo is also a Portuguese variety. So you're kind of working in the same. Uh, anyway, the plot, the, the block of, of Tariga Nacional has always been fairly sizable. 
uh, particularly given what we discovered, which is it is a pain to grow. It doesn't want to be trained. I was always like, it's like trying to train a, a cat. It's very slow <laughs> to establish itself. So like for years, I mean, what we planted in 2007, even in harvest is 2013, 14, you're like literally picking 10 berries. Oh my gosh. Three berries. <laughs> It's it's a very, it's like a string of pearls, kind of, Mm -hmm. it's not a a dense cluster. And so like to fill a bucket of Terriga Nacional is like impossible. Um, The reality though is the other side of Terriga Nacional is it's very small berries with very thick skins. And so it makes for a real punch. As soon as you can get it into the winery, you're like, I love this stuff. Uh, Because it's just, it has an enormous amount going on. It has good fruit, has excellent tannins, has good acidity. It has a kind of, most of us describe it as a fennel note, right? Which Mm -hmm. is different from everything else. It has a lot of color, obviously, given the skins. And so, like, I remember one vintage of our Tempranillo Reserve. It was like 96% Tempranillo and 4% Tariga, yeah. you could watch the color. Just color. Go, <laughs> <laughs> it was much darker because Tariga Nacional is just like this. And so, you know, as much as, uh, you know, we have moments in the vineyard, I mean, we consider it basically uneconomical to grow. Um, but consider it's, it's our estate vineyard. We can just choose to say, hey, it may be, but we can use it in a very select way yes select way and so the the wine you're having is part of what we call our signature series Mm -hmm. and part of it it has the signature of the winemakers on the back that's you know uh but what they are are single vineyard single varietal wines right so there's Mm -hmm. the signatures right um but anyway they're you know they're very low volume that's only 25 cases of wine that was made from that oh wow and so much effort to get (laughs) So, so it's a very, you know, these are, you know, yeah, these are very targeted wines. And, you know, what's interesting about it is anyway, just to hold up is I have our 2019 Morved open. Oh, okay. This is what our normal label looks like. And one of the things about Pedernal Cellars, if you compare it to other wineries in Texas, and this is sort of, it's a very generic statement, is that our wine program is very much based on blending. It's always been an important part of what we do. Uh, And so when we formed the signature series, we were really trying to set out like, hey, these are lots of wine that if we just blended them, it'd just be a loss to that lot, right? They have so much character that we want to set them aside. So we came up with a completely different label, completely different everything. And basically all signature series wines are either 25 cases or 50 cases. That's all they are. So, um, well, this is, this is definitely, I agree with the fennel and what's to me kind of a cool aspect is of it is that it is deep in color because, you know, you really can't, I I can barely, barely see my fingers through it. And that's what I always, you know, tell people like that's how you determine it, but it's not petite Syrah deep. It's not purple deep. It's it's like garnet ruby, you know, it's a lighter deep and it's a beautiful color. And this is a 2018 and it is it is not um, the tannins are are lovely They're You know, it, it's not gripping at all. The acidity is magnificent. Um I like I like a high acid wines and the acidity here it, it actually does salivate your your tongue but it's in balance with those tannins so it's not you know it's not out of control like people I don't think people tend to think acidity with red wine it, it's more of the of a white wine you know oh this is a high acid wine or whatever but acid is the background so I try to tell people no acid is the background it's the backbone of a wine but the problem is, is sometimes with the tannins, they clash with each other. And well, and I, I would also say that's I mean, to again talk about what makes Texas wine distinctive is that we are in high heat conditions, right? right? We don't have fog, we don't have maritime influence. And so for us, picking decisions are very much, I mean, we need phenolic ripeness, but we need acidity as well. 
And so generally speaking, our wines compared to California wines, which can be just huge because you can let them hang out and you're not just losing acidity in the process. Right. We have to say, no, it's got to come off, which means, yes, you don't have some of that hugeness, but yes, you have that more like the acidity is very, you know, very front and center. Uh, and that is actually very important to us. It's also because we work so heavily with Tempranillo and Tempranillo is a, an, it's an acid challenged grape, right? I mean, for lack of a better description of it, uh, it starts to lose acidity fairly rapidly and the latter part of it's, it's growing. Uh, and that's why I like in Rioja, it's blended with very often blended with Graciano to try right. to bring that acidity back up. Uh, so we're very often in Texas, we are kind of like, Obviously, sugars are the first criteria, but acidity becomes one of our like driving criteria. And it does mean that, you know, I, I do all the labels for the winery. And at some point, you know, I was, you know, I asked Dave, like, well, what's the alcohol in this wine? Right. So I can put it on the label. And it's like, well, 13.5, right. <laughs> it was in Texas. That's like almost certainly close enough to be correct <laughs> most <laughs> wines just fall right fall in that Whereas in california i mean increasingly 14 14 5 is more nearly the range because you can get that higher because you can you can get more phenolic ripeness it, it works very well with bordeaux varieties mm -hmm. because you work out more of the pyrazines they become more they become fruitier Right. So there's, there's reasons to do it in those conditions, but we don't have those conditions. And so you're not going to see that in Texas wine. So what you're describing is very much also a reflection of our growing conditions. So. And now what are, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about uh, in the article was about how Texans, you know, you, and you just grow up knowing that you don't mess with Texas. Like it's just, you know, um, and I laugh every time because now, uh, you know, thanks to my parents, I have started watching Young Sheldon. And, uh, you know, um, so I started watching it and I absolutely love the show. But there's so many comments of, you know, Texan attitude and Texas, you know, bravado and bigger is better with Texas. And that was kind of like the angle that I wanted to get at. And was it really... Um, able to fully get there, get there with the article. Um, and I think that's kind of what Tariga also is like, you know, you, you've got to be, you've got to be bold to be growing this where, you know, in conditions that, you know, it's not going to give you a lot of, of tonnage and you've got to do this to it. And, you know, you've got to nurture it, but you know, you've got to deal with it. Um, so how, how do you think, and you could say it doesn't, but how do you think your winery represents, you know, that Texan attitude, that Texas bravado? Well, I mean, you're, I mean, there's no question we, you know, as I said, it, you listen to our history and like we started with Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot, Chardonnay. It's like, you know, we're, we're definitely one of the wineries really testing, like, what can we do? What can we do well? Uh, we, you know, we made a, a very conscious decision, like we're going to have to find something we can do well and, and sustainably. Right. And obviously Tempranillo was one of the part of it. Um, but you know, there's no question that, I mean, we've, was, we do have winemakers and people who work in the hospitality side who are from California and some of what we consider the more benign world parts of the world for growing grapes, because we sort of have every problem right i mean we just you know we have late spring freezes we have raccoons we have you know birds we have hail we have you know and sort of you're you're that is part of the whole thing is like to try to make wine under conditions that are clearly you know as we always say it's like the, the texas landscape is not a friendly landscape i mean my father's from california so, and we go to San Diego every year, right? Oh, well. and, so, and we go and sit uh, when we visit at Mission Beach, right? Just to <laughs> put in context. And so we go sit in that grass. It's the nice, softest grass you've ever felt. Texas grass can be unpleasant. And that's before you're carried away by the bugs, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just so prickly and everything. And so, yeah, the, the Texas environment is not, you know, it, it's not a friendly environment. 
And yet at the same point, we can, and that's obviously the bravado part of it is, we can do something different here than you can in California, right? Uh, or Oregon or Washington or New York or Virginia, or, you know, you, you go through the list of major states and that sort of is what drives it. And I think it is an important part of recognizing we do think, and yes, maybe this is all ego, we do think that there's something distinctive about Texas wines that no other state is going to be able to imitate, not even our Southwest neighbors like New, New Mexico or Colorado or Arizona, who also make excellent wines. So, um, and yeah, no, I do think that's part of it. So it's, um, that's pretty funny. I, it's like you do, you have, you have, oh my God, I've got spring frost. You've had hailstorms. I, I know um, the winery uh, uh, Chateau Wright lost like all of their vines to to a hailstorm, right? Uh, but raccoons, that's a new one. That's a new one. Are they choosing the grapes over the garbage pails that are nearby? Is that well in the in the in rural? I mean, obviously in an urban area, they will choose your garbage pails because that's much richer. But no, and uh, it's very funny because you know. W- Obviously we have birds, we put a bird netting, uh, okay. but with the raccoons, there's not much to do but to trap them, right? Yeah. And you can very much see the difference between birds and raccoons because you go through a vineyard that raccoons have gotten to, I mean, those little hands of theirs, it's just like, boop, boop, boop. They start at the bottom and they just rip everything down. Oh my they gosh. Eat it like crazy. So you, you have to trap them. Um, so that's not even a concern for a single vintage. They're destroying the vine as they're getting to the vintage. No, they're mostly eating grapes. It's, oh, okay. it's his okay. last few weeks. No, it's his last few weeks. But no, they're really annoying because if they, but they'll just go down a whole row I and mean, they could decimate a row and there's wow. almost nothing left uh, because they're, I mean, those little hands of theirs, you know, could pull wow. grapes as well as we can. So. <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe somewhere in the future you know you, you can train animals to do amazing things maybe maybe you can train the the raccoons to the harvest raccoons for you the grapes. that would be great <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that um i realized as i was doing this article and you've mentioned it uh, a couple of times is that tempranillo seems to be kind of you know, high up there in terms of growing grapes, what, you know, the variety that's there. So what about Tempranillo seems to make it an ideal grape for, for Texas? Yeah, no, it has, I mean, one thing, like, well, let me start with the growing conditions. I mean, that's what we were most conscious of when we made the decision to, to bet on Tempranillo is that we had grown, as I said, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot that need a long season to, to work out those pyrazines, those green notes, so that they're no longer like annoying, right? And the thing about Tempranillo is it's known as a little early one because it ripens very quickly with full phenolic ripeness. So it is truly ripe. It's not just like, you know, done <laughs> or something like that. It's actually fully phenolic phenolically ripe. The other thing about temperate, so that's extremely important in Texas. It grows well in all of the major wine regions, which means the high plains, the hill country, and west Texas. It cannot grow in the southeast because it's too humid, but for the most part, they grow hybrids because it's too humid. They have too many problems with Pierce's disease and other problems. So for the all the major growing regions, it grows well. It is very terroir expressive, meaning it's very different in the hill country from the high plains. It's different in different parts of our own vineyard, right? Uh, in our 2020 vintage, because Tempranillo was some of the least affected by our particular conditions in 2020, uh, we have like four or five different Tempranillos that are vineyard designated, and they're all different, substantially different. And that's the other thing about Tempranillo is there's only so many, and I'm not just talking about red grapes, but red grapes that are truly the king of grapes in the world, right? There's Cabernet Sauvignon, obviously. Syrah is obviously one of them. But Tempranillo is one as well, as is, of course, Sangiovese. And so, and what I mean by that is these are grapes that depending on winemaking techniques, aging time, you know, what you do, you can create an enormous number of different styles. Uh, In the case of Tempranillo, 
historically from the Spanish, it's been aging profile that is the most important decision point. Um, but, you know, as I say, Tempranillo, you know, it has even more of that in terms of like site specific expression and things like that. Just, just as you see with Cabernet Sauvignon or uh, Pinot, I was not forget Pinot, it's another <laughs> great grape. So, uh, but no, there's, there's only a few that just had this amazing, you know, metaphor, you know, metamorphosis okay, they so could do, yeah, depending on where they're grown, when they're picked, what the winemaking is, what the aging is, you know, everything. Uh, and Tempranillo is in that category. There are other grapes that do really well in Texas, but none of them necessarily have the complexity that Tempranillo does with the degree to which it's so easy, relatively easy to grow in the state. So, And so I do have your um, High Plains Tempranillo here. Mm -hmm. So this is the 2018 mm -hmm. um, Tempranillo. And so uh, how would you, how would you describe this to somebody as a, you know, like, let's, let's go to, you know, talk of, let's go to Spain, let's go to Tempranillo, Rioja. Um, how would you compare this to an actual Spanish Tempranillo? The High Plains Tempranillo, uh, the thing of, one of the biggest differences between the hill country and the high plains in terms of growing conditions is the high plains has enormous much higher elevation than you expect it's about it's over three thousand feet above sea level which most people are like what it's absolutely dead flat uh and it's just it's one of the things about texas is like you start in houston and you drive to the high plains which is about an eight hour drive you're driving uphill the whole way very very slowly so the hill country is sort of halfway there and so you're now literally in the high plains and what that means is that you're a it's a semi-arid and so every night the temperature just goes boom, right and so they have a 30 degree diurnal during the growing season meaning the heat of the day the cool of night is 30 degrees in the hill country we only have 20 degrees generally speaking so what that does is it preserves fruit flavors and acidity um, in the Tempranillo and the white grapes and everything else. But since we're just talking about Tempranillo. And so I would say the High Plains, a uh, High Plains Tempranillo is much more like Rioja than, than you would see like in the Hill Country. The Hill Country is probably more like Toro. Um, you have much more structure. You know, this is an area of, where no, you're not gonna get the elegance of fruit flavor and acidity, but you're gonna get really strong tannin structure and um, you know, leather notes and the you know the the less fruity notes. Obviously, blending those two together, as we do in our Tempranillo Reserve, which is one of our wines, is actually an incredibly felicitous blend. So it's one of the things that we do. That's why I mentioned that blending is very important to what we do. But yes, if you're just looking at that high plains and then definitely at 2018, I think is very typical in that it is fruit dominant. It's not structure dominant, not that the structure isn't there. The acidity is excellent, good tannins, but what you more nearly get is that you know, high fruit, that just like cherry note that is like the center of the... Mm -hmm. The fruit structure of of Tempranillo. So now you have. So let's go back to that blending concept. So you're not only talking blending varietals. You're 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 talking the same variety, but from your different vineyard sites to yes. add that complexity to add those levels of each of each thing. So you have five vineyards you have one estate and then you source from four others is that right I or know. yeah we have Colgan vineyards we're actually managing it wasn't in what you had we are now managing another estate in the hill country uh, and then we buy all their fruit from them it's a small but uh, we're completely managing it and then the the in the high plains we these are contract relationships so mm -hmm. in the high plains you have I mean, these are like fifth and sixth generation farmers. And so one of the things they do is grapes. And so in some cases you actually plant the block and then they manage it for you. And then you buy the fruit from them. Okay. Every contract is slightly different depending on how it is managed. 
So uh, we have, you know, at this point, I think we have about 10 different partners. Uh, I don't want to go into the details. We have some problems with um, a compound that is used to reduce weeds for cotton called dicamba. And it's negatively, in fact, it was a ghost to broadleaf. It's negatively affecting the vineyards. Oh. And so we've started to, we have more contracts, more vineyards that we contract with now in the High Plains. Uh, and, and many of them much closer to Lubbock, which is a central town, because they don't spray there. <laughs> oh, okay. So there's no dicamba up there. And so the vineyards are more vigorous. So and this is un, under lawsuit. It is, it's a wow. huge issue. It's happened in other regions in in the United States where, you know, you're, you just have competing farming and what is good for one farming is not good for another farming. And eventually it works into a lawsuit because everybody wants to make a living. So hey, it does. It does. As sad as that is, what that really highlights is how much whatever you're doing in your soil travels. Oh, yeah. And, and, no, you know, right. whatever you're doing travels. And so many, it, that's a tough concept for some people to understand. They're like, you know, they're like, well, this is my plot. This is my thing. I can do whatever I want to it. If you want to farm more, if you want to farm more organically, then be my guest and farm more organically. But I'm going to do this this way. But what is becoming more and more painfully obvious is no, I want to farm organically and you're impacting my ability to farm organically because, yeah. you know, and you think about it, even, even um, pests, right? You, you know, you can have, how do you think, you know, phylloxera traveled, you know, those little buggers aren't literally, you know, running through the vines and getting from one site to another. They're hitching a ride through the track, you know, through the tractors mm -hmm. or through the boots or, you know, moving the dirt. And I think that that's something that needs to be paid more attention to. And, you know, that's why everybody's got to get on board with the mother nature and treating her nicely, because what you're doing impacts what I'm doing and impacts a larger spectrum. No, there's no question. No, there's no question. It, it is, it, yeah, it, it's always frustrating debates because, you know, you're always talking about someone's livelihood. Uh, that's at the other end of it when you're looking at the farming aspect of it. But it, it is also recognizing that, and it, I mean, it, it's a worldwide debate that you can't live in your own little bubble <laughs> as much Climate as you want to try <laughs> yeah, and, and all these things. And you're very conscious of that it, when you're in agriculture, because it does matter what your neighbor does. Uh, and yeah, it makes a huge difference. So, but anyway, but, uh, but yeah, no, we, as I said, we contract with various bread growers in the high plains and it's, you know, it varies from year to year and we have to be fairly nimble on our feet because as I said, we do have, we've only had a few early fall freezes. We have a lot of late spring freezes in, uh, to work with. And so in order to fulfill our program, we have to sort of say, okay, you're going to only have that much after all. And so, you know, uh, and even at, at this time of, you know, we're, we're obviously in the midst of harvest here in Texas. Uh, har harvest just for those in California can't believe this actually starts in late July wow yeah it's very early uh, but it's just as well because otherwise all these grapes would be sitting out in this terrible heat right uh, so that's why we have to focus on varieties who that can completely you know ripen Maybe. Um, is it earlier than normal this this season because like we're not harvesting at this point but there's vineyards that are harvesting already that this time of year for us, they wouldn't have been. This is an early yeah. season. Um, it's an early season, even for early Texas. vintage. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just because we basically, usually we start hitting summer temperatures, which for us means mid nineties in June, we basically hit it mid May and it's been absolutely consistent. And, I mean, mm -hmm. we've basically been hitting high 90s to over 100 almost mm -hmm. consistently since mid-May which is very unusual and we're actually we're also in a drought 
uh, we've had very significant rainfall since November of 2021. Wow. Wow. Yeah, no, we're the, for most people, I mean, the, the last season we can compare to this is 2011. Um, and that was very dry, but it wasn't as hot. This is just both. <laughs> really. Yeah. That's kind of the same thing for us. Uh, the summer temperatures came in earlier than they normally come in and they're just sticking around. So, mm-hmm. you know, you have, you have X amount of time frame that's normally summer temperatures, right? And you would hope that, okay, well, if they come in a little earlier, that affects those grapes in a very dramatic way that it's coming in earlier, but you hope that it's just shifting the whole thing, but that's not what's happening. What's happening is it's starting earlier and we're still in it, <laughs> which is longer than, you know, that, that normal period. Yeah, no, we're, we're just hoping, hoping that because in, in central Texas, I mean, you can see hot weather into early October, not oh. atypically. Usually you have some kind of lessening of it in September, but we're really hoping, I mean, A, sometimes we do get August storms, which will help cool it down. Uh, But we're also just hoping that we do get an October, a a September, like, cool down. Because it's just been, I mean, it's just, I mean, I, you know, I'm losing plants at my home, right? That I just can't, they can't deal with this much heat. It's just too many days. So, and what, what's your, what are your, climactically because we talked about the raccoons and all that by climactically what is your biggest concern is it at the beginning of the season like during that flower that delicate flowering time or are you more concerned towards the end of this towards the end of the season or even before the flowering no our, our our toughest season is basically from march to may because everything can go wrong right we can have late spring freezes okay. we can have hail which comes when the shoots are very tender oh. uh, and then yes we can have shattering events right we get all of those during that early season and that's usually the most important once we're here obviously things can go wrong obviously it can start raining it has i mean i was it 2016 vintage it was hot dry hot dry hot dry hot dry and then it started raining and we're like, oh, we'll stop. We'll stop. No, after 10 days of rain, we're like, okay, crap. We're just taking everything off. We're just not. Oh, my everything. gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So we can have things like that happen in Texas, which seems illogical. Uh, but you realize, I mean, what happens is we do get, particularly in the hill country, we do get gulf influence. And hurricane season is ramping up, right? And generally speaking, hurricanes don't come this far inland. Okay. But they can. <laughs> right and they do uh, sometimes <laughs> yes so but no i would say the the part of the season that just makes us cry is from march until may that is i mean year after year after year those are the the events that are just incredibly destructive and you're pretty defenseless against them in some cases there's only so much you can do because the plants are so fragile and try to right. come out and you know and all these things so yeah i would say that's that's the hardest. Or generally speaking, hot and dry in the summer is what we get, which is of course ideal once you're in the the high growing season. Right. As long as you have enough irrigation water, because in Texas, basically irrigation is good. good. I mean, you have to irrigate. Have to. Yeah, right. because you know, even if you look not this year or last year, but if you look at Texas rainfall, and I've done this, like comparing it to Napa and Sonoma, and you're like, you look at it, and you're like different in you know annual rainfall but i'm like no you have to understand like a third of that occurs on one day (laughs) right right so So that was not very useful (laughs) that was something i saw um during you know doing the research or whatever they're like oh well the annual rainfall is about this and i'm like well that's not that's good you know Mm -hmm. that's good um, then they were like, no, 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 no. That happens like in one day, two days, all at the, all, a week, you know, all at yeah. the same time. Yeah, we'll just get like everything at once. So, yeah, that's, that's not good. And, it, you know, cause towards the end of the season, this is something that I've spoke to about also is people get so paranoid about when it rains, when it's close to harvest, how it changes, you know, that sugar level, how it changes, you know, the, the physiology of the grape. 
And I laughed hysterically when, one time, um, Gary Everly, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but he's, oh, yeah, he's, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, okay. Right. So he's, he's, he's Paso. Right. And he was like, so it rains. So you don't need to rush out to go harvest when it rains. Cause it's going to be warm the next day and it's going to dry up. You just harvest, you know, it all makes back, you know, what it was beforehand and that's Paso. But if it's raining for 10 days straight, it's not, it's not yeah. quite the same thing. Yeah. But I, um, yeah, that's an interesting uh, this, uh, observation in Paso, but yeah, you do have that drying condition. Uh, but no, generally speaking, rain in the latter part of our season, it happens, but that's, you know, of all the things like that you compare us to Oregon or Germany or France, that part of the season, which is so stressful in those regions, is not for us. Is it right? Because generally speaking, we're hot and dry through our harvest, and you know the rain comes later if, if we're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> when you start praying for it, right? Yeah. You're all yeah. out there doing a rain dance to try to, yeah, bring it on, bring it on. Yeah, no, exactly. So, uh, but no, the the spring is really stressful. That is our stressful season. That's just. Okay. So, um, where do you see Texas? What? Well, I don't know how to exactly phrase this. So, I think Texas has a problem, as with any younger growing regional region, wine region, right? Yes. Regional wine region. What? What do you think? People like me who want to explore Texas wine and want to share what it is, what do you think needs to get out there to the listeners of this or, you know, to to the article readers and things like that about Texas wine? Where do you see it going in the future and what what can Texas as a whole do to promote their region? Well, I mean, the thing we talk about internally the most often, obviously, is that we really should be distributing more widely. Like if you look, you know, if we compare ourselves to Washington and Oregon, which, you know, both of whom um, successfully export themselves internationally, right? Um, we don't do enough of that. Now, obviously, it's economically lazy on our parts because we can be because three of the five biggest cities in the United States are in Texas, right? And we're quite aware that if we could just get them to drink more wine from Texas, we're doing fine. And it, from an economic point of view, it makes the most sense. And in fact, uh, apparently Austin is now large enough that it's 11th biggest city, right? Wow. So we have, you know, we have a lot of major urban areas and they're also, Texans are very, Pro Texas, if no one's noticed, uh, and so you know the fact is they do come down and visit the wine regions and do visit us because we are, as of the last pass I've, I've I know of, we are the second most visited wine region in the U.S. Wow! By just tourist numbers, right? This is tourist numbers. I'm not saying quality tourism or anything like that, but just the number of people who come and just taste wine because there's a long tradition of people visiting the hill country in, in Texas, um, partially because people come up from Houston because Houston has terrible weather, if no one has ever noticed. So they would come to the hill country. They also would come to hunt, go, come for the peaches. And then you have both Austin and San Antonio. They're feeding it. And of course you have Dallas as well. Um, so, but yeah, no, in terms of what people outside of Texas should notice is, I, you know, we keep pushing for it, you know, to have some presence in some important uh, wine lists, right? There's a few mm -hmm. wineries, it happens sporadically, because as I said, I do think we do have styles of wine that are going to look different from what you can get from any of the other major and minor wine regions in the United States. Or but even... that's terroir, right? That's I mean, terroir. that's, it, it, that's it, what it is. If every, if every Tempranillo tasted the same, whether you're in California, Texas, Washington, Spain, why drink it? Why, why bother getting a different Tempranillo? Yeah, right? And I can say Tempranillo is an excellent bet that no Tempranillo tastes like another Tempranillo. It's like an incredibly 
you know, it just, it's a very expressive grape. So, uh, but yeah, no, seeing more visibility in the other markets. I mean, the other thing to be aware of is that of course, uh, during the pandemic, people became somewhat more aware of this is that, you know, wine does have the advantage of, you know, certainly if you tasted it or you know what you're getting, it only comes in one size, it, you know, it packs really well. <laughs> and so shipping it is a real thing to do. I mean, I have, uh, I have wine club memberships on the West coast as well as the East coast. Right. Uh, and so, you know, definitely Texas ships to California because California is very open to shipping. And so this is obviously another way to just take advantage of the fact that unlike the other parts of the beverage world, the direct consumer shipping laws, even though they could be better, they are relatively generous in terms of what you can get where you are, you know, particularly mm -hmm. if you're in California. And so if you want to try Texas wine, pick some Texas wineries and order some Texas wine. So, um, you know, yeah, I don't I don't remember what the stat was off of the top of my head, but a very large portion, which is what you were saying, a very large portion of Texan wine is just consumed in Texas. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's a huge percentage. And it's not surprising, given the, the youth of the 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 region. I mean, you know, if you're, you're sitting around California. I mean, I, I looked it up recently. I mean, 81 percent of the wine produced in the United States is made in California. So if you're sitting in California, you just have a lot of choices there. But I will also say that partially through its own self-marketing, California wine has a, a distinctive profile that even transcends all of its regions at this point, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you compare Temecula to Paso Robles to Napa to Sonoma and beyond. But anyway, those bigger wines has become sort of the California signature uh, and, you know, obviously you can go to Washington and get something different, or you can go to Oregon and get something different, but you can also go to Texas or New York and get something different. Right. right. And I do know Texans do love their wine because we get a lot of orders from, to, to ship to Texas. Okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, you know, I, it's, I, I think in terms of recognition, I think you're just young. Right. And so if it's wonderful from a winery aspect to be able to sell out easily, like going to your big cities that you have and be able to sell out. But I think to get to that next hurdle, you know, there there needs to get outside. And that's exactly what you know, that's what you're saying is you need to get outside. I think one of the biggest things that uh, with Paso is, you know, it got recognized as as one of the, you know, USA Today, one of the best, you know, recognized wine region. And that's just a popularity vote type thing. But that brought recognition to Paso and then it's kind of started to explode there, you know, from there. Um, and I think from doing my research for the article, there's a lot to I don't think any region can survive 100 percent if it's only wine. And you guys are definitely have so much more to offer than just wine. It's like they, like you said, you can come and you can hike, you can come and, you know, you have beautiful outdoors. So it's there. I think the biggest problem right now is just you're young in the wine world and, you know, it's, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to learn about it and share about it is to get the news out there. No, no, I know. We, I very much appreciate you you know, looking at the infrastructure we're dealing with and yeah, what we, how we can present ourselves nationally because yeah, no, it's, we are no question. We're a young wine region. And, and I, I would really say it's only been in the last, may now be 15 years, but it's been the last 10, 15 years. We really are growing the right grapes and, you know, that makes a huge difference. I mean, mm -hmm. Napa was growing the right grapes for, 30 years before the judgment of Paris, right? Right. Uh, and even though the ones that won, like in the case of the Stag's Leap, had only was a very young winery, they immediately were working with the right grapes. Right, so, right. And, that and that's growing good. pains of any region, right? Any region has to learn what, what it is. Unfortunately, with grapes, when you 
find out it's not the right vine, um, it's not the next year that you. <laughs> that no, no, you it takes <laughs> it's like a five year. Oh, turn around. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, well, I want to thank you very much for coming on and for sharing the wines. The absolutely loved the Tariga Nacional. And I cannot wait to try the the Tempranillo also. Um, but in the meantime, where can people find Pedernalis uh, sellers? How how can they get to you? How can they order your wine? And, you know, social media, website, what do you got? Yeah, no, I mean, we're, you know, www.pedernalissellers.com is obviously our uh, our winery and we have a wine store uh, on it. And as I say, to California, it's easy to ship wine. Uh, we are Pedernal sellers on all social media except uh, Twitter, which was Pedernal wine because of the length. <laughs> Darn so, Twitter. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. And the other place you can find us in terms of some of the things we do is Texas Fine Wine, which is a group we're a part of. Uh, and you'll see some of the events that we do. And a, 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 usually annually, we have a bundle with these other Texas wineries. And this is a good chance to try us, but also three other premier Texas wineries. And so it's uh, we will be doing a holiday bundle. And so that's an excellent t- chance to try a range of Texas wine uh, from different producers. So all of them, you know, some of the best. So. As like a single shipment? Single shipment, yeah. That's fantastic that you all work together to to do that because I'm sure that's not the easiest to coordinate in terms of um, the TTB and all of that, like who's shipping, who's doing what. So, well, it, it's it, it's an issue. it's almost more difficult in terms of forming the group and finding a group of wineries that we all believe in each other's wines. Every single vintage we've been together since 2014. Oh wow. Wow. Yeah, it's it's at the time I know in like California, Washington, Oregon, there's very strong government led organizations to try to promote the wine of the state. There is nothing like that in Texas. Essentially, okay. So you are supporting each other. That's yeah. It. And we just we for, we formed a group to try to do something because it was like, you know, it's to just promote your own winery. You know people usually want to try several wines at once, right? Right, absolutely. And so, yeah, forming this group was a way of saying, hey, okay, fine. You're not just interested in us, but you might be interested in the group of us. <laughs> so. Well, that that's fantastic. I mean, I, I love that. I absolutely love that. And will will you be promoting that on your site? At, like, do each of the wineries have that on their site so they can go to your site? Yeah, social and media. Say, yeah, social yeah. media. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on and I appreciate it for, and honestly, for all of your help with the article, you were so instrumental in me guiding my way through the Texas wine industry um, and the wines that are there. So I completely appreciate that. And I hope you have a great week. I, you too. I hope you make it out sometime. You can actually visit all of us. I would, I would love to, I will absolutely say that it is, um, it was probably one of the more difficult articles that I've written one, because I did not, when I pitched it, I did not grasp at how big of a piece of pie I was, <laughs> I was taking. And then as I started diving into it, I was like, Whoa, this is big, which is why it got narrowed down, narrowed down, narrowed down. I think my, my actual first draft was like 4,000 words. <laughs> and, um, it, it got narrowed down because nobody wants to read 4,000 words about anything. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that was my, my first thing. It was a wonderful learning lesson for me to make sure I focus in on what my, what my topic is, but I hope that, you know, you read it and I hope that it, you feel oh, that yeah. it did, it did justice to, to the region, uh, the best can, but I would absolutely love to come visit one day and actually see these regions, in live these AVAs, you know, for myself in line, you know, in real life and understand a little bit more of how they're interacting with each other and interwebbed with each other. So keeping fingers crossed one day. 
You're very welcome. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So have a great day. I, I'm going to have to pour myself a little bit more so I can always end because I always end with my little, um, with my raise a glass to you. Thank you very much. And I will say slancha. <laughs> <laughs> have a good evening. <laughs>